In the early spring 2008, I proposed to Sabrina while I was wearing gumboots and a life jacket far out in the wilderness of Canada. And I thought my chances were pretty good, not only because I was dressed perfectly, but also knowing Sabrina has no chance escaping. <laughs> it happened that we paddled 2,000 k's down the Yukon River, and both of us thought at the time this would be our last big adventure. The reason Sabrina was already four months pregnant and everyone around us said, finally, you guys will settle down. What we experienced was amazing. It was the pure and wild nature that really touched us. Sabrina, being pregnant, felt very comfortable in this environment. She completely trusted in herself, believing her body was made for this, so why doubt it? There was no negative stress and no one that could interfere or change her way of thinking because we were completely cut off to the outside world, not having a communication device. You could call this being stupid, but coming from a generation, having grown up without all those tools, it didn't seem important to us. Not being connected to the outside world made us be more connected to ourselves and extremely focused on what we were doing. By the way, Sabrina said yes, and soon after, our first daughter, Amira, was born. And we realized we cannot settle down. What we truly wanted was to keep living our passion. And with Amira, it became even more meaningful. When Amira was 18 months old, we had this dream of finding the long-lost cabin built by the adventurer Nicolas Vanier, as described in his book, The Snow Child. Without any exact location, we knew it would be hundreds of kilometers away from the nearest civilization, and the only way of getting there would be on horseback, as there is no trails. And how else could we otherwise carry our daughter food and supplies for many months at the time? Before we took off to Canada, we did not have any experience with horses, and there was people telling us, this is impossible, and something you definitely don't do with a little child, saying we should take our responsibility as being parents seriously. But when you follow your passion, you also have the will to learn, and things become normal and natural for you because you're in your environment. You've got to stop listening to people when they say it's not possible to do what you want to do, because they might be a fish trying to climb a tree, talking to you being a monkey. <laughs> when we had to cross a river, and we had to do this often, we didn't just do it casually. Having a mirror with us made us be even more careful, being aware of any kind of danger, knowing every little mistake could be fatal. The horses had heavy loads to carry, but so did we, knowing to have the full responsibility for our child. And we could not pass it on to someone else like it often gets done in life. We also got used to not having a trail out here, but finding our own one. Not having a given trail also means that you can make your own decisions by taking the path in life that is the right one for you. All our senses came alive because of the quietness we faced, also knowing to be the only human beings out here. And the longer we spend in nature, the more we became one with it again, and we realized this has once been our natural habitat. Today, we look at the wilderness as being a dangerous place. And yes, it can be. Life is dangerous. But funny enough, we are not afraid of driving down the highway, having our child on the back seat, doing 120 k's per hour. When you leave your comfort zone, of course, you will also face problems. And after one month into the trip, we entered this very dense forest, and moving forward became very slow and suddenly almost impossible. In a situation like this, of course, stress became a factor, especially for the one of us going up front, leading this way. But I don't tell you who that was. <laughs> Have you guys in the audience ever gotten yourself into a stressful situation with your partner starting to argue, maybe sitting in the car, 
because you've taken the wrong turn off like I did? <laughs> Congratulations. So you know exactly what I'm talking about. Do you think that Sabrina and I could be heard arguing hundreds of kilometers away in the nearest civilization? You're most welcome to raise your hands if you think so. <laughs> to be honest, we could not be heard at all. Well, maybe 20 k's away, but that's it. So I have a very valuable tip for you guys now. Next time, get yourself into a real problem and the arguing will stop, I promise. You will stop complaining how difficult life is. Often in life, we make things that aren't really a problem to be a huge one. Out here, we were facing a real problem, a problem that was not just solved by complaining, arguing, or blaming each other. This was the moment when it became very important to us to work together in a strong team. There was no one being able to help us out of this situation except ourselves. When giving up is not an option, that's when you get the chance to become the strongest version of yourself. For Amira, this kind of life became the new normal. She simply saw it as reality, and her happiness provided us with additional strength, reinforcing our belief that we were doing the right thing. Finding and reaching this long-lost cabin after three months was a very special moment for us, and it brought tears to our eyes. But this feeling could only be so intense because of all the obstacles we have overcome together. And all of this was only possible because of our passion, respect for each other and nature, as well as basic trust. But also because we did not care when other people said it's not possible to do what you want to do. What else did we learn from this trip? that having a child does not have to stop you from living your dream life. Your child does not make things complicated. It is your belief, thinking that you have to change everything or using your child as an excuse for not living your dreams anymore. Pretty soon, we decided to spend the entire winter out here. We had no running water, no electricity, and civilization was hundreds of kilometers away from us. Amira was three years old by now, and Sabrina was already five months pregnant with Naira, knowing there is no doctor within reach. Why did we not become afraid about those circumstances? Our previous adventure had shaped us so strongly, believing in ourselves and trusting each other. It was so quiet out here that we connected so deeply to ourselves and nature that no longer we were observer, but became part of it. It felt like we gained more senses, and each of them was strongly expressed. When you have to live off the land, hunting your own food to survive, you connect even deeper. And Amira wanted to take part in everything we did, and that was so wonderful to see. Also being able to show her a way of living that is almost not existing in our modern world anymore. When the rabbit filled our stomach, Sabrina used its skin to make mucklocks for Amira. We also caught a lot of fish, but when the variety of food becomes very limited, we became very creative by finding different ways to prepare it, so we built our own smokehouse. Did we know how to smoke fish before we got here? No, we didn't. But when you are suddenly not able to ask someone or Google, you become very creative by simply trying to find your own way, doing your own things, because you have no other option. Our days, they ended peacefully by candlelight and oil lamps in a cozy, warm cabin because of the firewood we chopped every day. There was no luxury as we know it, but the real luxury was the quietness and the time for each other. Was it hard to survive in the wilderness? Yes, it was. But it didn't feel that way because everything we did served for survival and it showed us how important it is to do something in our life that suits us and our identity to make us happy. By now, 
everyone had given up trying to convince us to settle down. And when Naira was born, we traveled through the outback of Australia with camels we trained ourselves. But there is a little story to this and how it all happened that we ended up with camels. In 2015, we actually had this plan of riding through Patagonia with horses. And we were smart this time. We already had horses organized waiting for us in Patagonia. In Canada, we first had to find them. So well prepared and experienced, we thought this time it'll be an easy game for us. But what we forgot was that life always holds a spare choker in its hand. Two months previous to our departure, we went for a test ride at home and our dream was destroyed. Naira reacted allergic to horses. I tell you, I first had my problems. Of course not with Naira, this was heartbreaking. But it was difficult to accept not having this dream ahead of me anymore. But our older daughter, Amira, said, Oh, well, listen, Mum and Dad, that's not a problem because the three of us can still ride. <laughs> and Naira, yeah, she can just walk behind us. Of course, this was not an option. But once more, it made me think trying to find another solution. And then, just like Mother Nature had a choker, we had one too. Instead of horses, we changed to camels and went to Australia. <laughs> Australia has the biggest camel population in the world because they introduced them early 19th century. Our plan was to get four camels to build a string so we can all ride and pack them with all the gear and supplies we need, just like we did with the horses. Buying four wild camels was not a problem, but to train them to become tame was something else. Respect towards the animals was very important. It wasn't just up to us how quickly progress was made and when. By the way, a wild camel only cost us $200, and when they're tame, you can actually sell them for many, many thousand. So this explains how we can afford those trips. Anyway, after about three months, things started looking pretty good, so we decided to put saddles on them to th see how things work out, and they didn't work out. <laughs> out of the four camels, we only ended up having two good ones, which was not enough for our trip. And on that day, we were completely devastated. But giving up, has never been an option in our lives. Too often in our life, we walk up to a wall and then we stop and turn back instead of thinking how we can climb over it. Being faced with problems is always a chance of making yourself better. Seeing reality brought us to the idea of building a wagon because herefore we only need two camels for pulling and this photo shows me after about five months of intense training, very happy and strongly believing that we have achieved our goal, that by tomorrow we can take off into the outback of Australia. But this is what it looked like two minutes later, <laughs> ending up in a ditch. Getting thrown back on the way to your goal, to your dream, is always part of it. But if you find yourself not giving up, also means your dream holds deep personal significance to you. So we continued, and two weeks later, our dream became a reality, and we traveled 1,600 kilometers in three months through the outback of Australia, and once more living a family adventure we will never, ever forget in our lives. When you travel slow, you also have a lot of time diving deeply into yourself, thinking about you and your life. And suddenly, I had this flashback. I was about 10 years old, sitting in my classroom, looking out the window, daydreaming about myself living some big adventure out in nature. My teacher called me to ask for the answer to a question, which of course I did not know, because I was completely somewhere else. 
This happened a lot over the years, and in the school report would always be a note to my parents saying, Marcus is dreaming a lot, he's not focused on his studies. Today, today I smile. I smile when I see my own children similarly lost in their own daydreams, and it makes me think, what if we took our dreams seriously? What if we listen to them and allow them to guide us towards the lives we truly want to live? I urge you to embrace your dreams because they have a message for you. They hold the key to living the life you truly desire, filled with passion, focus, creativity, basic trust and respect. But most importantly, they remind us that life is meant to be lived to the fullest. So I encourage you, to take a step back from the hustle and bustle of daily life and ask yourself, what is my dream life? What fills me with a sense of purpose and joy? Then use your passion to guide your actions, to fuel your creativity and to cultivate a deep sense of trust in yourself. I hope that you will too will embrace your dreams and live the life you were meant to lead. Thanks. Thank you.